All right, our main topic for the day is Taylor polynomials and Taylor series. And we're just trying to fit in as many examples as we can in the time that we have. And remember, just like last Friday, we motivate this by trying to approximate functions. Here's a question. What is the quote unquote best, so say quartic, not quadratic, but quartic, fourth degree polynomial approximation to f of x. Let's use our old friend here because it's so familiar. f of x equals one over one minus x, sum of a geometric series with a equal to one and the common ratio equal to x, uh, near x equals zero near x equals zero. By the way, the use of the word near here is a choice. People use different words and effectively mean the same thing. We are going to call these best approximations Taylor polynomials. And in the formula you used for the last couple problems on today's assignment, should have used this formula here. They use the word near there, near zero. But they use different words down there, about or around zero. Sometimes you might even see the word at zero. Any of those words effectively mean the same, same thing. They effectively mean use this formula. But instead of using this formula straight away, let's try to derive it in a sense, for this example at least. We're going to let p sub 4 of x be a general fourth degree polynomial. Usually we put go from high power to low power, but it's more traditional to go from low power to high power in this case. A plus BX plus CX squared plus DX cubed plus EX to the fourth say, where that is not the number E. A, B, C, D, and E are all numbers that I have to figure out. And these are all multiplications. For example, this term here is d times x cubed. It's, it's not dx cubed. There's nothing to do with integrals here. d times x cubed. What did you do with linear approximations, even in calculus one? Remember those? Linear approximations, tangent line approximations. You try to match up the function value at a maybe zero, and the derivative value there, so that you have the same output at the point and the same slope. Well, let's do that, but let's go further. Let's not only match the function output, but also the derivative output, and also the second derivative output, and also the third derivative output, and also the fourth derivative output, if we're going to do a degree four. Let's try to match all of those. Now it's hard to visualize what that means exactly. You know, it's only easy to, to visualize function values, derivative values, slopes, and maybe second derivative values, certainly at least in terms of seeing whether the graph is concave up or concave down. But third, fourth, fifth derivatives, how do you visualize those? I don't know how to tell you the truth, it's too hard. You'd have to be really, really trained well to visualize Look, looking at a graph, what its, what its fourth derivative would look like, okay? Unless you're looking at thinking about it in terms of polynomials, then you might be able to guess, but it's very difficult looking at a small piece of the graph to tell what, for example, its fourth derivative is at some point. So we have to approach this symbolically and just trust that matching up these values will be a good idea. And it turns out that it is, otherwise we wouldn't be teaching it. So we need to find the derivatives of both of these functions. With f of x, we could certainly use the quotient rule, but it's going to be more helpful to avoid the quotient rule and write f of x as 1 minus x to the negative 1 power. That'll be easy to take derivatives, an easier way to take derivatives. So let's write down the function 
f of x is one minus x to the negative one power. And then it's, let's start computing its derivatives. f prime of x, be careful, bring down the negative one, subtract one from the exponent. And then what am I forgetting if I don't go further? I'm forgetting the, go ahead. Derivative of the inside, I'm forgetting the chain rule. What's the derivative of one minus x? It's negative one. The two negative ones make a plus one. So this simplifies to one minus x to the negative two. Second derivative, differentiate this. We can avoid the quotient rule. Bring down the negative two, subtract one from the exponent, multiply times the derivative of the inside function. Chain rule again. Simplify the two negatives make a positive two, one minus x to the negative three. Third derivative, f triple prime of x. Two times negative three is negative six. Now we have one minus x to the negative four power times negative one. This becomes positive six times one minus x to the negative four power. And I'll go one more, f quadruple prime will be negative 24, one minus x to the negative five times negative one is positive 24, one minus x to the negative five. What's the pattern in those coefficients? Go ahead. Uh, factorial. They're factorials, yeah. Two factorial right there, three factorial, four factorial, Actually, even here, we got a one factorial and a zero factorial. Not a coincidence. Let's also, let's also plug in zero. We wanna match up these function values at zero. F of zero is one to the negative one, which is one. F prime of zero is one to the negative two, which is one and plugging zero into these functions, f double prime of zero is two times one to the negative three, which is two. f triple prime of zero is six times one to the negative four, which is six. And f quadruple prime of zero is 24 times one to the fifth, negative five, which is 24. Do something similar now with the polynomial. Take its derivatives. Well, the, the function value itself is zero. If you replace X with zero up there, you just get an A, right? All the other terms go away. What's the first derivative? A, B, C, and D, and E are all constants. The derivative of A is zero. The derivative of B times X is B. The derivative of cx squared is 2cx. The derivative of dx cubed is 3dx squared. And the derivative of ex to the fourth is plus 4ex cubed. Plug in zero and it simplifies to b. Second derivative. Differentiate b with respect to x gets zero. The derivative of 2cx is 2c. The derivative of 3dx squared is plus 6dx. That's a six there, not a b. That's six times d times x, not six dx. It's six times d times x. And then plus 12ex squared plug in zero, get 2c. Third derivative, 6d plus 24ex, plug in zero, get 6d. Finally, the fourth derivative is the constant function 24e, plug in zero, get 24e. What do we want? We want to choose A, B, C, and D so that we get these numbers. A must be one, 
B must be one, two C must be two, so C is one. Six D must be six, so D is one. 24 E must be 24, so E is one. Every single number is one. A equals B equals C equals D equals E. They're all ones. That doesn't always happen. Therefore, the answer for this fourth degree Taylor polynomial, which is what it's called again, that best approximates this function near zero is just one plus X plus X squared plus X cubed plus X to the fourth. The coefficients are all ones. This should not be surprising. This is supposed to be approximately the function one over one minus X when X is close to zero. That's the F of X. And yeah, that makes sense. This is the first five terms of the geometric series for F of X, right? One over one minus X is the sum of a geometric series. A is one, the common ratio is X. This is a plus ax plus ax squared plus ax cubed plus ax to the fourth. For the series, to say it equals this, we go forever. This is just an approximation. But it's good to see that it matches the first five non-zero terms of the infinite series. We got it with a different method. It's cool, right? Different method gave us what we would expect if we had to guess using geometric series. Pretty amazing. A good first example. Let's go on to a second example. Let's make the second example a geometric series as well. F of X equals one over one plus X squared which to avoid the quotient rule, I'll write as one plus X squared to the negative one power. This is the sum of a geometric series. It is the same as one over one minus negative X squared. It's a geometric series with A equal to one and common ratio negative X squared. It's going to equal this. If the absolute value of X squared is less than one, which means X itself also has an absolute value less than one. We know that already. Let's see if when we compute the fourth degree Taylor polynomial approximation, we get the same answer as the first three non-zero terms of the geometric series. We should. Now the calculations get a bit nasty here. These derivatives get to be kind of unpleasant. I did the first three non-zero derivatives. I did the first three derivatives with the first class and then had Mathematica do the fourth derivative. Let's do the same with you guys. Problem is you end up needing the product rule and things get complicated. At first, we don't need the product rule, just the chain rule, bring down the negative one, subtract one from the exponent to get a negative two power. But then the chain rule gives times two X. It's that extra X that's going to make things more complicated here. Negative 2X times 1 plus X squared to the negative 2. Now to find the second derivative, I need the product rule. In addition to the chain rule, this is my first function and this is my second function. So the second derivative by the product rule is the derivative of the first function, which is just negative 2. Just like calc one gateway practice here. Times the second function plus the first function, negative 2x, times the derivative of the second. Bring down the negative 2, subtract 1 from the exponent, chain rule multiplied times the derivative of 1 plus x squared, which is 2x. Simplify a little bit. <laughs> 
then we're going to find one more derivative. Um, at this point, I did decide to do something that's not necessary, but I decided to try it to see if it does make things a little easier. I factored out a common factor of two and also a common factor, believe it or not, of one plus x squared to the negative three power. Oops, this is supposed to be a negative two power here. Wait a minute. How can I factor out one plus x squared to the negative three power? I don't see a negative three power there. Uh, it's there if you make this thing inside the parentheses negative one plus x squared to the first power because if I distribute this through the parentheses, you'd add the exponents and negative three plus one is negative two. Again, what I'm showing you here is not absolutely necessary. I just decided to try it thinking maybe it would help a little bit. I'm not sure that it helped that much. Uh, this simplifies to three X squared minus one. And now for the third derivative, I need the product rule once again. There's my first function, there's my second function. And this will be the last one that I do by hand. Derivative of the first, negative six, one plus x squared to the negative four times two x times the second function plus, I'll put it down here, plus the first function times the derivative of the second, which is just going to be a six x. Okay, let's stop there for, for doing it by hand. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to match the function values here at x equals zero. I still have to plug in zero with the function values of some polynomial that I could write like the previous page, like this if I wanted to. With this polynomial, these calculations would be the same, right? With this one. If I do the exact, I do the exact same calculations I did before. So these things are not going to change. I'm going to get a, b, two, c, six, d, twenty, four, e. What's going to change is the numbers over there. Plug in zero into all these things, including f itself. F of zero, which by the way, the function itself can actually be thought of as a derivative of itself, but you'd call it a, a zeroth derivative because you haven't actually taken a derivative. That'll be consistent with some notation I'm going to show you in a bit. Plug in zero into that, get one to the negative one, which is one. Plug in zero into this one, get zero, right? Got an X there. Plug in zero into the second derivative in this form, get two times one to the negative three times three times zero squared minus one. Two times one times negative one is negative two. Plug in zero here. Both terms go away. You get a zero for the first term because of the X right there. And you get a zero for the second term because of the x right there. You get zero. Hmm. Those simplified a lot. Let's have Mathematica do the next one. So f of x is one over one plus x squared. What does Mathematica make it look like for its third derivative, for example, like that, if you don't put those together, I think if I do slash slash together, it will put them together. Doesn't look quite the same as, uh, as mine, I, but that's just deceiving. If I do together of mine, it'll work. And by the way, when you do Mathematica commands like together to put fractions together, you can either do slash slash at the end, slash slash together at the end or together at the beginning and, and then your expression inside the square brackets here. 
So let's see if we can get the same thing. Yep, same thing. Okay, so that looks good, no mistakes. What does the fourth derivative look like? There it is. Plug in zero to that. You can see you'll get 24 times one over one to the fifth. 24. Hey, four factorial, is that an accident? No, it's not. But wait a minute. This is like one factorial or maybe zero factorial is a better way to think of it. This is like negative two factorial. And with the fourth derivative, Mathematica implies the fourth derivative at zero is 24 is four factorial. We're only getting even factorials here and we only are alternating, we're alternating in sign it seems. Is that right? Oh, wait a minute. The infinite series, the geometric form of it, doesn't have any odd power terms. This is right. The B is going to be zero. The D is going to be zero, which are coefficients of x and x cubed. And the coefficient of x to the fifth would be zero, and x to the seventh would be zero, and x to the ninth would be zero. We're only going to get even powers of x, and the signs are going to alternate just like we already know. But I, I do have to divide by these factorials when I simplify because remember, these things are going to be the same. So you, in front of the a, b, c, d, and e, you're going to have still a zero factorial, a one factorial, a two factorial, a three factorial, and a four factorial. And I have to divide by those to solve for a, b, c, and d, and e. So what I'm trying to say is the final answer, P4 of X is F of zero, which is zero factorial times or plus zero X because F prime of zero is zero. So the B would be zero. The C would be negative one because negative two is going to equal 2c. c is going to be negative one, which I could write as negative two factorial over two factorial. The d, the coefficient of x cubed, is going to be zero. And the e, the coefficient of x to the fourth, is going to be four factorial over four factorial, which simplifies to one. This simplifies to one minus x squared plus x to the fourth. The exact same thing as the first three non-zero terms of the expansion we got from geometric series. This is good. What's it good for though? I mean, it's good in terms of getting right answers. What's, a, what's this good for? One thing you could argue it's good for is a little bit of a glimmer of understanding why graphs look the way they do, at least near zero. For example, this was an approximation. Where is it? I'm missing it. Okay, here we go. This was an approximation to one over one minus X near zero. So if I graph, for example, the graph of the first three non-zero terms, the quadratic that I'm looking at right there now, near x equals zero, it's going to be a pretty decent approximation to the graph of this one near zero. What does the graph of that quadratic look like? It's got a vertical intercept of one. Linear term is just x. In other words, the slope of this one at x equals zero is one. 
draw a little line segment with slope approximately one. And also the quadratic part here, the x squared term is going to have a positive coefficient, meaning the second derivative is positive. The graph is concave up. Now the graph of the entire parabola would be a would be a parabola. The graph of the entire quadratic would be a parabola. Don't draw the entire parabola. Just this little tiny piece of it, because we're trying to ultimately draw, draw the graph of this function. I know the graph of this function will look like that in year zero. That's one benefit of this. You might argue it's a silly benefit because we've got our technology. It was definitely more significant in the past when people didn't have the technology. It's got more significant benefits for us still. So I'm going to make the entire graph here. Of course, there'd be a vertical asymptote at one. It's going to look like that over there and like this over here. We're again just in this approximation, just seeing effectively this tiny piece of it. Similar kind of thing with this, this example. If we graphed one minus x squared, for example, which looks about like this near zero, that's a pretty decent approximation to the graph of this function near zero. What does the entire graph look like? The entire graph looks about like this, amazingly. We're just effectively seeing this little piece of it when we look at this quadratic part of the approximation. Talk about that more on Wednesday. I need to go on to some more computational examples. Uh, let's get a Taylor polynomial approximation to the sine function. But before I do so, let's write down the general formula that I'm hinting at here with these first two examples. The general degree n Taylor polynomial approximation to a function f of x near or about or around or at some number x equals a. In most examples, a is zero. But in theory, we could do any value of a. We do want f of x, if we're going to use the formula we're about to write down, since we use derivatives of it, we do want f of x to have all derivatives of all possible orders to be able to do this. First derivative, second derivative, third derivative. So we don't want weird functions like the absolute value function that are not differentiable. And there's more complicated examples you can come up with as well. We want ordinary familiar functions here. Call it P sub N of X. The formula that this stuff hints at is what I'm about to write down. This first example where we solve for A, B, C, D, and E is hinting at the formula I'm about to write down. I'm not doing the full derivation of it. It's F of A. And when A is zero, that's F of zero plus F prime of A times X minus A. When A is zero, that's F prime of zero times X. Plus F double prime of A divided by two, which I'm gonna think of as two factorial, times X minus A quantity squared. plus f triple prime of a divided by three factorial times x minus a quantity cubed, et cetera. I've got plus dot, dot, dots in here. However, this is going to be a polynomial, so I have to stop somewhere. And I'm stopping with the nth degree. So my final term is gonna have x minus n quantity to the nth power. It's evidently the nth derivative of f at a which I'm not writing completely yet. 
divided by n factorial times x minus a to the n power. But how do you write the nth derivative of f at a? You know, what if n is a million? Do I have to write a million primes? Of course not. That would be silly. So I could use words. I could say this is the nth derivative of f at a, but, or I could define a new notation. The new notation is an f with a superscript of n that's got parentheses around it evaluated at a. That's not an nth power. It's an nth derivative. nth derivative, if n is a million, that's the millionth derivative. That's called the degree n Taylor polynomial approximation to f, f of x near this point x equals a, which is most commonly zero. And the idea, again, is that we hope this is a good approximation to f near x equals a. The Taylor series would take this exact same pattern and just go plus dot, dot, dot at the end. And that would make it a Taylor series. Plus dot, dot, dot to make it a Taylor series. Instead of a Taylor polynomial series as an in infinite series. Big picture, what are we doing? We are trying to represent functions ultimately as infinite series, as power series, as we've done with functions that are clearly sums of geometric series, like one over one minus x, and one over one plus x squared. We're trying to do that for other functions that are not sums of geometric series. For what purposes? There are many purposes. One thing I can hint at is that you can use these things to approximate functions. And you might say, well, why? I've got my calculator. Well, somebody had to program the calculator. How'd they do that? Well, yeah, there's software to program computers or calculators. There's high level programming languages that will compute things for you. But, but how do they compute things? How do they compute the sign of something, for example? Is there a circuit you can make that automatically computes the sign of everything? I don't think so. It sounds way too hard. But you can make circuits that add and multiply and therefore also subtract and divide. And series are made up of arithmetic operations, adding, multiplying, subtracting, dividing. And you can get any degree of approximation you want in the interval of convergence by taking enough terms. Wait a minute, is that what they really do? Not the whole story. It's not the whole story, but part of the way there. The whole story also involves using properties of Functions like exponentials and trig functions, like trig functions being periodic, that's part of the story as well. We know they're periodic with period two pi, sine and cosine at least. And it also involves something called interpolation. But to understand interpolation, you need to understand this first. Well, it's ideal if you do at least. You could understand interpolation without understanding this, but. It's more ideal to understand it after you understand this. So it's part of the way there. You might be saying, well, I'm not an electrical engineer. I don't care what the circuits are doing. I just want the answers. Fine. Series are, have other applications in science and engineering and even in math applied to science and engineering. I'm thinking in particular of differential equations. So you'll either take some of you differential equations in linear algebra with me in the fall, or plain differential equations with Dr. Alk sometime next year. Either way, you'll get some series applications to analyzing differential equations and trying to solve them or at least figure out approximately what the solutions look like. We might even get to that a little bit in this class, in chapter 11, a little bit.
So let's apply this now to the sine function. And let's say we go out to n equals seven. So I got to find a bunch of derivatives and plug in a, let's take a to be something simple like zero as we often do. Take a bunch of derivatives. Oh, it doesn't sound so pleasant, but guess what? You know, some functions it's easy to differentiate. E to the x, sine x is easy to differentiate. Its derivative is cosine. Its second derivative is back to negative sine. Its third derivative is negative cosine. And its fourth derivative is back to itself. The fourth derivative of the sine function is itself. Wild. Fifth derivative. Did I do five primes there? Yeah, OK. Back to cosine. Sixth derivative. Back to negative sine. Seventh derivative. I'm having fun doing my primes here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I could use the other notation. But I was having fun doing all the primes. Back to negative cosine. Plug in a. a equals 0. f of 0 is sine of 0 is 0. <coughs> f prime of 0 is cosine of 0 is 1. f double prime of 0 is negative sine of 0 is 0. F triple prime of zero is negative cosine of zero is negative one. F quadruple prime of zero, sine of zero is zero. It's gonna keep going, the pattern continues. One, two, three, four, five, six primes, zero. And finally seven primes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Fun, fun, fun. These are now the numbers you plug into the tops of these fractions. And by the way, I could have written the first term with fractions as well, because zero factorial is one and one factorial is one. So I could have written those with fractions as well. What are we going to get? All the even powers of x are going to go away. Zeroth power. Second power, fourth, sixth, only left with odd powers divided by the corresponding odd factorial. One divided by one factorial, negative one divided by three factorial, positive one divided by five factorial, negative one divided by seven factorial. P, P7 of x is going to be one times x minus one over three factorial times x cubed plus one over five factorial times x to the fifth minus one over seven factorial times x to the seventh. And it's uh, traditional to sometimes just leave it with factorials and not simplify them. But of course you can simplify them if you want. And here's what you would get if you do so. That's a 5,040 right there. There is your seventh degree Taylor polynomial approximation to the sine function near zero. It is the best seventh degree polynomial approximation to the sine function near zero. No other seventh degree is better. I haven't defined exactly what that means, but that is the best. If I wanted the infinite Taylor series for the sine function, I'd have to go plus dot, dot, dot. The amazing thing, the astounding thing, is that if I go infinite, I get equality. It actually equals the sine function. Just because I do these approximations doesn't guarantee that, though. The, the sine function, the cosine function, e to the x, all the functions you're used to, are very special in that their Taylor series equal them. There are examples of functions, and I'll show you an example, either Wednesday or next Wednesday after Easter, 
of functions whose Taylor polynomials don't equal them. And in fact, the Taylor series doesn't equal them, except at one point, A, X equals A, is the only point where they're equal. That sounds crazy, but true, there are such examples. They're weird examples though, not of the kind you're used to, but I can make them. I can, I can figure one out right now. I, I know what to do basically. I'll show you one again, either Wednesday or next week. This is really astonishing stuff. You might be saying, oh, this is boring. I gotta do all these derivatives. Don't focus on the boring part. Focus on the big idea and how astonishing it is. You can program the computer to do all the boring stuff for you. It's astonishing that these end up being equal to these functions quite often when you do the infinite sum, the infinite Taylor series. Even though the functions themselves in the series are not geometric, they're no longer geometric. Um, I should mention you should work at trying to at, uh, feel comfortable also writing this with summation notation. In this case, and I'm going to assign a couple problems like this. It is traditional to also start the index of summation at zero. If I do that and I want four, four non-zero terms, I have to go n equals zero to three. To get the signs to alternate plus minus plus minus, I can do a negative one to the n power. That'll be positive when n is positive one when n is even and negative one when n is odd, which is what I want. The powers of x to make them all odd, starting at one, I can do a two n plus one. And I need to divide by the same power to the corresponding, take the same the power and make it a factorial on the bottom. That's how to write that with summation notation. And that's something you should work at. Last example of the day. Got that? Last example of the day is f of x equals the fourth root of one plus x, which of course is the same as one plus x to the one fourth power. And let's use a equals zero. We are always seeming to do a equals zero, but I am gonna assign a couple homework problems that are not a equals zero. They're a equals something else like one or two or something. So use the same formula. You can use this formula without understanding it. Just use it. That's what I'm gonna do. I gotta take the derivatives. And I made it so that the derivatives are fairly nice. Bring down the power, subtract one from the exponent, one fourth minus one is negative three fourths. Chain rules times the derivative of one plus X is times one. I don't need to put the times one, but I did anyway. I won't bother here from now on. Second derivative, bring down the negative three fourths, get negative three sixteenths, but I'm gonna write it as a negative three over four squared instead and leave it unsimplified because that way I'll see the pattern better. which would may allow me to write it as a summation more easily. Yes, you could write that as negative 3 sixteenths as well. F triple prime of X, two negative signs cancel, you're left with a three times seven, which is of course 21, but leave it as three times seven. I get a four cubed in the bottom. I get a one plus X to the Negative seven force minus one is negative 11 force. Let's go one more. F quadruple prime of X. I'm gonna get a negative sign again. Three times seven times 11 over four to the fourth 
times one plus X to the negative 15 fourths. Well, I could keep going to my heart's delight. But now I'm gonna to wanna to plug in zero. F of zero is one to the one fourth is one. F prime of zero is one fourth times one to the negative three fourths, which is one fourth. I'm always gonna get the coefficient. This one's gonna be negative three over 16, which is negative three over four squared. This one I'll get positive three times seven over four cubed. With this one, I'll get negative three times seven times 11 over four to the fourth. These are not the coefficients of the powers of X yet though, because I have to divide by the corresponding factorials. Don't forget to do that. P four X, I guess is what we're after here going to be f of 0, 1 over 0 factorial, which is also 1. Maybe I should go ahead and write the 0 factorial because I am after the pattern here. That is, of course, a 1. Plus 1 fourth over 1 factorial. Which, of course, is 1 fourth times x. minus this thing, well, plus this thing, which includes a minus sign, over two factorial times x squared. Let me just, I'll not write it as fractions within fractions. I'll write it as minus three over two factorial times four squared times x squared. I'll just write one fraction. The next term is plus, three times seven over three factorial times four cubed. And the next term is gonna be minus three times seven times 11 over four factorial times four to the fourth times X to the fourth. And of course, yes, you can simplify all these things. This here simplifies to a minus, so what would it be three, uh, 30 seconds. This simplifies, one of the threes can cancel there. I'd have seven over 128. And this is gonna be minus, so let's just use the calculator there. Three times seven times, actually one factor of three is gonna cancel. I'll have seven times 11, 77. One factor from the four factorial that has a three in it is gonna cancel. I'll have four to the fourth, and also times a four and a two, 2048 is what that coefficient would be. Can I see the pattern well enough to write this with summation notation if I'm thinking about the infinite? Call it piece of infinity of X. Could I possibly write that with summation notation? Probably, I uh, gotta be a little careful here. Maybe I'll go, N goes from zero to infinity. Uh, it was, it was a, a little tricky with the signs here, actually. They go, starting after this term, they go plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. But the, the zero term, it doesn't alternate in sign there. So maybe what I want instead is to make it simpler. Just a one plus summation n goes from one to infinity. Looks like maybe negative one to the, say, n plus one to make it positive when n is one there. X to the n power divided by, look at the pattern. Um, looks like it's an n factorial times four to the nth power. Oh, no, there, no that's, that's not quite right. Sorry. Ah, sorry. I forgot about these higher order terms looking a little different, sorry. One plus, Leave a little space in the top of the fraction here. What should I put in here? Um, I want something that's one when n is one, three when n is two, 
three times seven when n is three. Oh, that is getting kind of complicated. Ah. Um. Let's not try to finish this problem. Let's put question marks in there. It's doable, but in terms of nice notation, I'm not sure the quickest way to write it. I, I'd have to think, think about it for probably about 15, 20 minutes to figure it out. But it could be done, I think. Okay, Perhaps involving factorials adjusted in some way might be the way to go. All right, that'll be enough for today. See you on Wednesday.